slowly orbiting at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Starlab. Here, Starlab Research Director Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the universe. This week, space exploration team captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff encounter a massive, shapeless organism in the silent distances beyond Starlab. An organism whose power and pathology force John and Buddy to instigate the leukocyte maneuver on alien worlds. Star Labs, Jodrell McKenzie radio telescope has detected an unidentified energy mass slowly moving to the constellation of Cygnus, the Northern Cross. Entered in Star Labs Mycroft computer as Stellar Anomaly 505, the energy mass is being tracked in the radio telescope monitoring laboratory by Professor Arthur Royce and astronomer technicians Karen Stone and Carl Phillips. All right, let's try and get a visual on it. Karen, cross-link the 350 optical telescope and calibrate for maximum vector scan. What about polarization? We'll let that go for the time being. Okay. Carl, switch on screens 4 and 5 and interface the azimuth grid for Cygnus. Full resolution on both screens? Just on 5. There it is. Horizontal travel along submeridian 201. Beautiful, isn't it? Like a tiny star in silver mist. You think everything out there is beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Interface the DRS, Carl. Let's get a radial velocity on this thing. This can't be right. What's the problem, Carl? The radial velocity. I'm getting a synchronous redshift and blue shift. The anomaly is approaching and receding simultaneously. Yeah, not to mention that it's still moving sideways. Starting to cartwheel. Maybe we should. What? What happened? What is it? It's gone. Roy, look at this. I'm still picking up its radio velocity. Light wave readings when there's no light. What's going on here? It's on the screens again. Submeridian zero six eight. What? How long was it off? The retro time is just nine seconds. It just traveled two light years in nine seconds. Karen, run a total spectrum analysis on that thing. Okay. Uh, Carl, get a kinetic temperature reading. I'd better let Dr. Cassidy know about this. After a 20-minute conference with Professor Royce, Dr. Maura Cassidy decides to have the anomaly investigated at close range by space exploration team captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff. Half an hour later, John and Buddy enter Docking Bay 16, where they board the SET interceptor Solaris and stand by for launch clearance. <coughs> oh, sorry about that, John. I must have got something in my nose when we walked through the maintenance section. You sure you're not coming down with the cold? No, no, I think it's the primer they were using on that shuttle. Every time I get within 10 feet of spray painting, my nostrils backfire. <laughs> well, keep them open. You know the rule. If you're not 100% sensory and paranasal, you're grounded. If you get too stuffed up, we'll have to cancel the mission. Cancel the mission? Oh, boy! <laughs> That's what I like about you, buddy. Your willingness to face the unknown without batting a nose. Uh, I'll do the funny stuff, Skip. <laughs> Star Lab Control to Solaris. It's Solaris. Go ahead, Jerry. I've got an update on that energy mass from radio telescope monitoring. Ah, good. What's the story? The anomaly has moved to the top of the Cygnus constellation and becomes stationary one parsec away from the binary star Beta Cygni Albireo. Is it still generating second magnitude alpha waves? No. When it became stationary, its wave frequency changed. What's it generating now? 
They don't know. There's too much interference from the binary to get an exact reading. Now, hold on, John. Here's Mara. John, don't take any unnecessary chances out there. Just get as close to the anomaly as you have to in order to scan it. And transmit the data back here. We'll analyze the scan and let you know if there's anything else you have to do. Okay? Okay. Okay, buddy? Okay, Mara. John, what's wrong with Buddy? Uh, nothing that can't be fixed. His sense of humor is taking a nosedive, that's all. Oh, boy. Welcome to the worst pun of the century. We'd better get this show on the road before you come up with another one. Uh, I'll certainly buy that. What's the traffic situation, Jerry? We've already handled our pre-flight procedures. 30 seconds, John. 30 seconds. Okay, Jerry, we're online. Launch vector zero niner alpha, John. I'm opening the bay doors now. Remember what I said, you two. No unnecessary chances. Scan it and transmit the data. That's all. Stop that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I've created a monster. Starlab Control to ISA Transport 119er. ISA 119er, go ahead, Jerry. I have your revised docking orbit insertion coordinates, Rachel. Are you ready to program? Roger. DOIC Meridian 203 at subvector 17 Alpha, docking bay 28. Thanks, Jerry. ISA 119er out. Starlab clear on ITS frequency 19. Hi, Jerry. How are John and Buddy doing? Everything's okay. They checked in at 13.30, right on schedule. Good. Where are they? Between Pluto and Neptune. Uh, they should reach their warp-through coordinates in about six minutes. Mm. Well, keep me posted. I'll be up in radio telescope monitoring. Okay. Okay, Buddy, let's start the switch over to hyperdrive. Initiate sidereal search buffer overlap. SSB terminals are online. Parallel sequential links to substatus screen. VSLs are in phase. Primary and secondary parsec refractors to parallax subroutine one. Refractors are in the grid and stable at 303. Charge the warp generator and synchronize for a minus 10 interface. Sure, you're not coming down with something? I'm all right. See you in Cygnus. giant Jodrell Mackenzie radio telescope has detected a massive energy field in the constellation of Cygnus, 10.6 parsecs away. I've got an update on that energy mass from radio telescope monitoring. The anomaly has moved to the top of the Cygnus constellation and becomes stationary one parsec away from the binary star Beta Cygni Alberio. Three hours after the anomaly's discovery, Space Exploration Team Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff board the SET interceptor Solaris and rocket into deep space to investigate. Six hours later, the Solaris warps through the time-space continuum and arrives in the constellation of Cygnus, near the anomaly's last known location. I don't get it, Skipper. Nothing on the spectrometer, nothing on the gas amplification sensors, and nothing on the radiation scanners. 
Maybe it moved up into the Veil Nebula. Open the Parsec frequency. Let's see if they're still tracking it on Starlab. Solaris to Starlab Control. This is Starlab. Is that you, buddy? <laughs> yeah, it's you, all right. I'd recognize that sneeze anywhere. What's happening out there? Well, that's just it, Jerry. Nothing's happening. There's no sign of that, uh, whatever it was. Are they still tracking it up in radio telescope monitoring? Uh, stand by. I'll check. You know, I was just thinking, buddy. Maybe that thing's some kind of an organism. Well, I don't think so, John. I mean, a 2,000-kilometer-wide living organism that's uh, invisible? I know. I know it sounds pretty far-fetched. But if it were some sort of organism, that would explain why we are picking it up on the... Starlab control to Solaris. Solaris, go ahead, Jerry. Radio telescope monitoring says the anomaly went off their screens at about the same time you got there. Uh, Mara wants you to come back to Starlab. <sighs> okay, Jerry. Oh, by the way, have Dr. Rossiter break out some of her little yellow pills, will you? In spite of all reports to the contrary, I think I'm coming down with a lunar flu or something. Will do. Starlab control clear on Parsec frequency one. Solaris out. <laughs> hey, you better take an antiparetic and try and get some sleep. Ooh, yeah. Let's get out of here. What's wrong, Skipper? I don't know. Give me a status read on the ignition generator. The computer says it's okay. Mm, try it again. Thruster malfunction. Shut down the system, buddy. Let's have a status readout on the thrusters. Physical obstruction. Something's blocking the nozzles. It's got us. Something's got us. Hull oh, integrity subcritical. It's crushing us. My God. Shut down the bioscan indicators before the circuits blow. Don't be afraid. John, did you hear that? Or am I in shock? No, you're all right. I heard it too. What are you? Where are you? I am undifferentiated potential, a galactic wanderer. You are inside of me. What? Inside of you? I am the anomaly you were searching for. Uh, how do you know we were searching for an anomaly? The universe echoes with life, intelligence, voices. Yours, others, I sense it all. Our bioscanners. You're not an energy field anymore, are you? No. I am now a leukocyte, a white blood cell, a corpuscle, identical in many respects to those in your own bodies. Why a leukocyte? Why not an enzyme or a hemoglobin or an amino acid molecule? I mean, is a white blood cell hipper than a red one? Hipper? And smarter. More fun to be around. You're very amusing, buddy. Well, what do you know about that? A corpuscle with a sense of humor. Yeah, well, don't get too carried away. Remember, he's 2,000 kilometers wide. If he laughs, we're finished. You are sick, buddy. Oh, you mean I'm not amusing? I mean you're ill. Physically ill. Yeah, I know. And because you are, the leukocytes in your immune system have energized to resist the illness. I sensed this when your vehicle penetrated my other form. And because I have great compassion for suffering, I affected a sympathetic metamorphosis. You're communicating with us through our immune systems, aren't you? Yes. But I'm the one who's sick. Why is John able to hear you? <laughs> Doesn't that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Skipper. Oh, that's okay. There's nothing like a cold in the heat of an emergency. Emergency? Look at the life support enunciators, buddy. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Well, the shaking we took when you materialized around the ship damaged the primary oxygen flow matrix. The backup system's on, but there's only enough oxygen in that for seven hours. 
And after we warp back to our original parsec coordinates, it's going to take at least six hours to reach our home base. I think you'd better release us. I can't release you. Why not? Why don't you just reconvert yourself to energy? I was devitalized when you encountered me. And because I was born in this star region, I had come back to rest, perhaps to die. What's the problem? Maybe we can help. The leukocyte transformation process has depleted certain light wave frequencies necessary for my reconversion to energy. Well, then why did you transform yourself in the first place? I've never encountered beings like yourselves. I wanted to know you. Are you angry with me? No, I guess not. You may lose your lives because of me. Well, getting mad about it isn't going to help. Do you share Buddy's feelings, John? Yes, I do. What remarkable creatures you are. Open the Parsec channel, Buddy. We'd better let them know it's Starlab. Yeah. Solaris to Starlab Control. Starlab. Go ahead, John. Patch this transmission through tomorrow, Jerry. Roger. Stand by. Ordered to investigate a massive energy field 10.6 light years from Star Lab, Buddy and John warp the Solaris through the time space continuum into the constellation of Cygnus. <laughs> transforms itself into an enormous intelligent organism, a 2,000 kilometer wide leukocyte that envelops the Solaris and damages its primary oxygen flow matrix. Meanwhile, on Star Lab. That's right, Commissioner. The Solaris is impacted right in the middle of it. Well, if it was energy to begin with, why can't it transform itself back? Well, according to John, the light wave frequencies it needs for reconversion are exhausted. How much oxygen do they have? Less than seven hours. I just had a thought, Mara. The Solaris is outfitted with a whole arsenal of military and scientific lasers. Maybe they could use them to restore the light wave frequencies the organism needs to reconvert. You must have read their minds, Commissioner. That's exactly what they're going to try. <laughs> Okay, buddy. Let's put the laser generators online. Normal sequence. LG one, three, five. Okay, Skip. They're hot. LG two, four, six. Malfunction on number six. Shut it down. Okay. Put them in the grid. We have positive grid interface. Open laser port one and calibrate for a 5,000 angstrom green light discharge, soft beam. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific concerning the color or intensity of the light. <laughs> well, that's all right. We'll figure that out by trial and error. The only thing I'm worried about is if our lasers have enough saturation potential. Well, fire number one, buddy. I feel it, but it's not having any effect. Well, maybe green isn't your color. Can we show you something nice in red? Why not? Open laser port number two, buddy, and calibrate for a 6,000 angstrom red light discharge. Right. Fire. I'm sorry, but red isn't my color either. How much oxygen is left in the backup system? Six hours, 19 minutes. Open up number three. Let's try 4,600 angstroms of violet. Starlight control to Solaris. Uh, Solaris, go ahead, Mara. Interesting thing out there, John. Are you left with the lasers? Uh, no, not yet. We've tried green and red, and we're getting ready to try violet. What's your life support situation? Critical. If we don't get out of here in 19 minutes, we won't have enough oxygen to get back to Star Lab. What about 
about the O2 packs and your pressure suit? There's only an hour of oxygen in them, Maura. And I don't think an hour is going to make that much difference. But what... God, I feel so helpless. It's not over yet, Maura. We've been in worse situations than this. As long as we've got oxygen and lasers and our wits about us, there's still a chance. Way to go, buddy. Maura? I hear you. Maura, does Commissioner White know what's going on out here? Yes, I talked to him a few minutes ago. Number three's ready to fire, Skip. Oh, good. Maura, we'll call you back when we finish the laser procedures. All right. Starlight clear. Hey, yeah. uh, now, let's see. Right. 4,600 angstroms of violet. Wait a minute, buddy. Come on, Skip. Minutes are at a premium. I was just thinking about Commissioner White. So? White, buddy. White. I still don't follow. What happens when you spin a color wheel? All the colors blend together, and the wheel turns white. And what do you see when you look at the stars? White light. What do the anomaly look like on the screens at Star Lab? White light. Right. That's it, buddy. That's our leukocyte maneuver. If we run all the lasers through a spectrum filter, we'll get pure white light. And if we interface all the laser generators, we'll have five times the discharge and saturation power. Yeah. Okay. Cross-link all laser generators and open the rest of the laser ports. All right. If this attempt succeeds, we'll no longer be able to communicate. I've enjoyed our encounter. And because you've made no attempt to destroy me, I will leave you with something you won't know you have till I'm gone. Shall we begin? Ah, uh, sure. All right, buddy. Fire. I am the firstborn of the universe. I am matter and antimatter. Singularity and synchronicity. The force that holds a bird in the air. The sounds you hear when androids dream of men. I am old. How do you feel, John? Uh, I don't know. I feel good. I mean, my body feels good. I'm not sick anymore. Yeah, neither am I. Whatever it was that made us sick, he took with him. He healed us. Leukocyte Maneuver was based on a story by Anthony DeWitt and was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, Corey Burton, and the Watermark Players with special guest star Larry Moss. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler, inviting you to join us for our next adventure from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. <laughs>